Hello and welcome to this video. My name is Barry Beckham. The title of this video is Exposure Logic, but a subheading could be the exposure triangle and the effects that that can have on the images we shoot. Every month I put together a slideshow with the results of my own camera club's competition and I also do some judging for other clubs too. So that puts me in a unique position to view lots of competition images. Now while looking at the images I'm often tempted to take a peek at the metadata of the image I have on screen because if there are any problems with the images I'm viewing you can usually find the reason in the settings that were used. As you probably know it's the metadata that records all of the settings like aperture, shutter, ISO and even the focal length of the lens we used. And we can see those settings in Adobe Camera Raw right up at the top right of the screen and also in Lightroom in a similar way. Now we do know that the shutter speeds, aperture and the ISO we use is going to impact the image we're shooting. A slow shutter speed can be the cause of camera shake or blurred images through movement of the subject. Although in some cases we can use them for creative reasons as you can see here. Apertures can impact on what remains sharp within the image and ISO can cause us problems with excessive noise in our photographs. The focal length of the lens we use is also important because that has a bearing on what shutter speed and aperture that we're going to need. Now here we come to the whole point of this video. When I've looked at the settings used for the images I'm viewing or judging, many of those settings I see don't seem to have much logic to them. Even some images that turned out pretty well. But why does this matter? It's because if we look at a picture that has some visual problems or faults, such as noise, subject movement, depth of field issues, camera shake, maybe lacking impact and contrast, then if you look at the metadata, I'm going to suggest that 99 times out of 100, you're going to find the reason for those visual problems right there in those settings. If the settings used don't cause the problems directly, they very often do indirectly because when we're in front of our image editor with the image on screen, the very first thing we have to do is to fix faults. Now in an effort to do that we can very easily make things worse. Now let me explain what I mean when I say the settings used don't seem to have any logic to them. I'm using the settings for an image that was submitted to a competition recently. But here for obvious reasons I'm not using that image, I'm using one of my own to demonstrate what I mean. Look at the settings used to capture this image because they're not logical and they don't make a great deal of sense. The ISO was set way too high at 1600 in a situation where it didn't need to be that high. Now I've simulated the typical result of a setting like this. We have a softness of the image and we also have excessive noise that we can see in the picture here. Noise that we could have avoided completely as I think I can demonstrate. We could have reduced the ISO to 800 and used a wider aperture of f11 to compensate. The shutter speed could remain at one thousandth of a second. We would get a slightly better result with a lower ISO but we're still likely to see some noise but of course we can go much further. At 400 ISO we can still use that one thousandth of a second shutter speed but we can compensate for the reduced ISO by opening the aperture wider to f8 
Now we're using a 28 millimeter lens, so f8 is more than enough for the depth of field we need. We might also consider that in some cases f8 is a nice mid-range sweet spot on many of the lenses we use, so it's quite a nice aperture to use here. Let's reduce the ISO still further to 200. We can still retain that f8 aperture, but we're going to need to compensate by reducing the ISO by slowing the shutter to a five hundredths of a second to allow in a little more light in that way. Now noise really shouldn't be a problem at all anymore, but of course why take the risk? because we can actually use 100 ISO. At 100 ISO we can still retain that f8 sweet spot aperture. We can compensate for the sensor being less sensitive than 200 by slowing the shutter speed to 250th of a second. Now everything is in our favour. We have a 28mm lens so we should be okay to hand hold the shot down to probably something in the region of a 60th of a second or even slightly less. But in fact we have 250th of a second so we would be fine here. We have an aperture of f8 that's going to be enough with that 28mm lens to capture the whole scene sharp which is what the intention was. At 100 ISO the noise is at a minimum and we have the very best opportunity to capture a quality image. The original settings used 1600 ISO are just not logical as Commander Spock always used to say. We didn't actually need F16. We didn't need a thousandths of a second. They were a massive overkill but by using them, it forced the author to use 1600 ISO to capture the shot. Now if your camera has an automatic ISO setting, you need to turn it off. That automatic ISO on some cameras is designed for the casual snapper. But if you're watching my video, I'm betting that you're aiming a lot higher than that. You need to be in control of your ISO all of the time and also the shutter and apertures too. Now here's an interesting point. Sometimes even when an image didn't show obvious visual faults, the settings used still made little sense. Now that tends to suggest that perhaps this time the photographer got away with it. They got a pretty good result despite using camera settings that were far from the most logical. But if we follow that along, it also tends to suggest that you're not going to be lucky all of the time, and your photographic success may depend more than it should do on a bit of luck. We shouldn't be trusting to luck. We need to understand our camera and those photographic principles a little better. Now it's confession time because looking back over 40 years myself I wish I'd got to grips with these issues quicker than I actually did. I wish someone back then had dragged me aside and said this is something you need to study because it's vital for all sorts of reasons. If we could look back in time you would find me making the same mistakes. It's very easy to be clever with hindsight isn't it? But I find myself wanting to say to some of the authors today, you're getting this part of your photography wrong. And if you could spend a bit more time understanding the exposure triangle, your pictures would be considerably better and your success rate would improve too. Let's take a look at the exposure triangle and think about each of those in turn starting with the ISO and here I'm thinking handheld shots let's leave a tripod out of this at the moment ISO should be kept to the absolute minimum but how do we know when it's the right time to increase it 
Let's look at this shot where we're using a 400 millimeter lens and we have a moving subject. With a long lens like that, we could, if we're not careful, introduce camera shake. And we also have a moving subject that could cause blur. Assuming, of course, we're not trying to use blur for creative effect. There is an old rule regarding shutter speeds that is easy to remember and while the digital age has changed things very slightly it's still a good rule to have. It says that you should always use a shutter speed at least equal to or greater than the focal length of the lens you're using. So in keeping with that low ISO principle if we keep it as low as possible with this image at 100 ISO, we can shoot the image using 250th of a second at f5.6. But with a 400mm lens and a moving subject, that could be a little ambitious, I think. So my aim here was for a sharp capture of the car. I'm deliberately avoiding the subject of image stabilized lenses too as they could confuse the issue a little bit. The lens I'm using here is already wide open as far as it will go at f5.6 so I can't get any more light to the sensor that way so we have no option but to turn to the ISO. By selecting 200 ISO I could increase the shutter speed to a five hundredths of a second. The light conditions were reasonably bright, but with a long telephoto lens and given the subject was moving too, the question we may be asking ourselves is, would a shutter speed of five hundredths of a second be enough to freeze both our movement and that of the car? At the time I judged five hundredths of a second might be a bit too close for comfort, meaning I might capture some shots sharp but maybe I'd lose some too. I felt that I needed a shutter speed just a little faster, so once again I can increase the ISO to 400 and then I can shoot using a thousandth of a second. These were the actual settings used for this shot and you can see that they've produced a pretty sharp image and there's very little sign of excessive noise. Now the one thing to avoid as you increase ISO is never, never, never underexpose. It's raising detail from shadows in your image editor which is going to make noise much, much worse. So we've managed to keep the ISO as low as possible, but let's just assume that while shooting the light levels fell a little bit more and we found ourselves shooting at a slow shutter speed again, maybe five hundredths of a second or even a little less. Well, we don't have a great deal of choice in that situation. We can't find more light with a wider aperture because the lens is already wide open. We want to retain the shutter speed somewhere around a thousandth of a second, then the ISO has to be increased. Will we introduce more noise if we go to 800 or 1600 ISO? Well, possibly yes, but consider this. If we really do have to crank up the ISO to 1600, then we should do so even if there's a risk of introducing more noise than we would really like. My reasoning for this is that there are some ways we can address noise in our image editor. So if we start off by making sure we don't underexpose our shots, we do give ourselves a good chance of using a high ISO without too much evidence of it. But, and it's a large but, if we don't raise the ISO and the picture is blurred as a result, there's precious little we're going to be able to do about that. We can't recover from an unsharp image. You could say that in some cases, high ISO and noise is the lesser of two evils, noise or sharpness.
Well, in this case, the important factor was getting the image sharp. But even if we had to use a 1600 ISO, the selection of that ISO, the shutter speed and the aperture, would still be logical. So coming back to the settings that delivered the result we can see here, it wouldn't have been very logical if I had selected 1600 ISO, but then closed down the aperture to f11 to compensate. Let's take a look at another example where the settings used were not logical, and the negative result on the image can be seen. It's just not sharp enough. Let's go through what should have been used and what may have given us a better result. We're viewing an unmanipulated raw image and at first glance the shapes and bold colour do have some appeal. But let's look more closely. An image like this needs critical sharpness because we're taking a reasonably close up shot and we're saying to whoever's going to view the image, look at these leaves. Well under the circumstances they need to be a lot sharper than they are. Perhaps not every single leaf in the shot, but certainly a lot more than we can see here. So let's take a look at the actual settings used. Using my shutter speed rule that a shutter speed needs to be at least equal to the focal length of the lens, we seem to be nicely on the right side of that with a shutter speed of five hundredths of a second. So why isn't the shot sharper? Well, it's because the issue here isn't a blurred photo caused by a camera shake, and we can see that because some of the image is sharp. The issue here is that the depth of field is too shallow because the settings used were not entirely logical. We're close to our subject using a 135mm lens, and that aperture of f5.6 just wasn't quite enough. We could have reduced the shutter speed to 250th of a second, which should be enough for hand holding this shot. Then we could drop the aperture from f5.6 to f8. Would that have been enough? Now I'm not sure I could have been absolutely sure of that at the time, so perhaps a better choice would have been for me to remain with 250th of a second, reduce the aperture still further, to f11 and to compensate just increase the ISO just a little bit to 200. The exposure we're looking at now records exactly the same amount of light falling on the sensor as the exposure I originally used 5 hundredths of a second f5.6 at 100 ISO. The sad thing here is that this shot is not critically sharp certainly not sharp enough as a standalone image. But a lot of money was spent to travel to New England in the fall in America, only to bring back an image that has been a victim of illogical settings. Fortunately, many of the others weren't. So there is a good example of why this is a subject worthy of our attention. With this next example, I'm going to use the settings used by an author of a competition image that was in fact extremely good. But nevertheless, the settings used were not logical, and the image displayed considerable noise when it didn't have to. Now this isn't the actual image of course, it's one of mine that's as close as I can find to the one I'm referring to, although that one was much better than mine. The coach in the original image was being driven through a dusty scene. Lots of red dust was being thrown up, but that was creating marvellous atmosphere. But there was still sufficient colour for the trees showing green on one side, which just held the entire image nicely together. All of the subjects riding on the coach was in the right sort of clothing for the time. It could have been a picture straight out of the 1800s. The problem with the image was that the author had used a shutter speed that was way, way faster than was ever needed here. 
Remember, this wagon is not moving very fast, probably no more than a walking pace, or certainly a slow trot. Let's take a look at the settings. 2,500ths of a second shutter speed for a subject we could have probably captured nicely sharp at 125th of a second, definitely 250th of a second. The aperture of f4 seemed to be ok, especially in this circumstance using a 70mm lens. Now we can see the problem in that high ISO. So let's get that ISO right the way down to 100 in one go. What's the exposure difference between 800 ISO and 100 ISO? Well, it's three stops of light. By reducing the ISO, of course, we're going to reduce the sensor's sensitivity to light, so we're going to need to find that light elsewhere. If we go from 800 to 400, that's one full stop of light, from 400 to 200 is another, and then from 200 to 100 is that third stop of light. So we've got to find ways to increase the light by three stops, and we have it right there in that shutter speed. The author could have shot their image at 100 ISO with 250th of a second shutter at f4, or maybe even 125th of a second at f5.6. Both would have given a very good result. So I come back to what I said earlier, that here is another good example of why this is a subject worthy of our attention. Despite the unnecessary noise in the image, it was still judged best in its grade. But isn't it a shame that an author found themselves in front of a really great subject in really good atmospheric conditions and almost lost the shot because the settings made no sense. I suppose we can say they got away with it up to a point because the image was successful. But the image does contain high noise and it really doesn't need to. Now of course there's going to be many times when we're out for real with the camera when things happen so fast the important thing is to grab some shots then see if time allows the settings to be checked but successful and consistent photographers usually have a very good grasp of the shutter aperture and ISO and their relationship to each other did you enjoy the video of course you did you're still watching if I'm going to judge someone and decide whether they've got anything valuable to say, I like to see what images they're producing. You can find my Flickr galleries from a direct link on the front page of my website, simple and easy to find, from the address you can see just at the top there, beckhamdigital.com.au. I also run a photographic and audio visual forum and you can find the address of that on the main page of my website just the same as the Flickr galleries beckhamdigital.com.au and my YouTube channel is growing rapidly all of the videos that I put up online are full HD and if you happen to be watching on YouTube you'll find links to the forum to my galleries below. I'll see you next time.